have and some things that we've got going on there. Uh, mobile classrooms we look at and then some of our uh, assessment and achievement data uh, that was quite impressive as you look through some of these this information. First of all, if we look um, on the Otago County system snapshot, you'll see that we have a um, one month operating um, budget of a little $5.6 million. Um, at this particular time, we had 2.31 months in reserve. At the end of this fiscal year, we estimated we'll have to close for about 40. Is that correct? And I'm looking over at my finance, uh, financial officer. You'll also look at the per pupil expenditures. Uh, Otago County is $8,618 uh, per pupil. The Alabama average is $10,092 per pupil. The uh, lowest system dollars and you can see the other breakdowns. If you look at the per pupil revenue source, and this is really a telling piece of information, the state average uh, is $6,568. Uh, local is, and this is for us, our local revenue per pupil is $1,913. And so that is what um, we get um, per pupil from, from local revenue. You'll look, we are 109 in the state local revenue, uh, 190 in the state rank as far as the um, high of the, the money from the state, and from the federal, we're 114. If you'll flip over to the next page, uh, as far as the school system revenue, uh, one thing that's really important to know, only 5% of our state money, our state uh, education foundation money, can only be used, or only 5% something other than personal labor. Okay? And if you'll see um, our salaries, um, the local our salaries are 40.5 million and the benefit is 16.5 million. And the non-personnel operations, that's the things like the other current units and things like that, so that's 2.8 million. And so what I'm going to do from this point on, we'll be referring back to this sum. Uh, but with new revenue with a new revenue source, we would be able to a lot of the same, or we continue the activities that we have started. There's a number of things that we've started since we, since I got here in, um, in January. Uh, some of the things that were already in place that we implemented or we, we fine tune. So if you'll flip over, uh, the next three things that I want you to look at is the infrastructure. And these are, these are the things, these are the buildings, the heart, the hardscapes that we're, we're using every day to educate our students. First of all, these are things that I noticed as we were, as I was interviewing for the, the superintendent position. You know, we do a phenomenal job when we've got buildings that are built in, we've got two, one built in 1936, one built in 1937. Many of you probably graduated from Otago County High School, just across the road here when it was the high school. Uh, Crackle Kindergarten, which is now Crackle Kindergarten School. Uh, Crackle Primary School was built in 1927. It would be hard to tell if, they were that, if these buildings were that up and well maintained, but as we get into um, the 21st century, it's hard, it gets harder and harder to maintain the wire integrity of the buildings because of the, uh, it, it, it's a result of the digital devices that are having to be used now. Uh, as a matter of fact, this school year alone, we have, as soon as you made the we have added about 4,000 Chromebooks, I believe it is, to our our digital inventory, uh, which puts a big, you know, it, it really straps our network. Uh, and that was another, something else as far as the infrastructure that additional or a new revenue source would help us with, uh, to upgrade our network system. Uh, briefly, we've got a network uh, that does a phenomenal, our network administrator does a phenomenal job, but when we've added this huge number of, of Chromebooks and digital devices that not only tax us while we're here in, you know, in our buildings, but they're running off of our network starts to show uh, on our network by slowing it down. And of course, you know as well as I do, this day and age, you know, digital access um, to students um, is, is, is a prerequisite for um, education, uh, education. Uh, another thing that I noticed and we do a phenomenal job with, but we could do better, our athletic facilities. Uh, we, you know, stand at Houston Stadium is a wonderful stadium. There's, you know, there's some upgrades that
that's, that's an important thing that we can upgrade uh, with additional, or we can plan to upgrade with additional money. Uh, we also have about 36 buses that will come off of the renewal fund. We get a, a portion of money each year uh, to replace buses that are aged now past the 10 years. And so coming up in 2022, we've got 36 buses that, that will be coming off of that. We don't get near enough money from the state to replace all of them. We kind of, you know, we have to, you have to, have to make good with what you got. Uh, also, one thing, another thing I noticed is I was, was we were interviewing and driving around. I'm a big proponent of our pre-K program. The state the office of school reading this pre-K program does a phenomenal job preparing kids uh, that are living in the playing field for kids that might not be able to attend a program at church or a daycare or something. Uh, we currently have um, four units uh, at Crackville Primary, excuse me, we have four units at Pine Level and two units at Crackville Primary School. We really need an additional two units and I'm happy to say we have applied for two additional units uh, to place in the area of the, the um, county that will most benefit from that. One of them will be within the, uh, if they're approved, will be within the, uh, the, the police jurisdiction of uh, I will say this, with our OSR grants, and they do, they, they do a great job providing money for it, but they're designed to, um, for the systems to start absorbing more and more costs as the years go on with the grants. And currently, out of our um, budget, we are paying about one Thank you. 
give up the, the uh, preliminary offers. So we're, we're working on that too. So that, that's all part of our career tech center that will be, um, that will be an operation we'll break ground probably in the next month or so. Another thing that's really important that I want to point out is our um, practical intermediate school operates under a unique setting. It's called the house setting, uh, where the, the, the school is divided into different houses by hall. This adds a family atmosphere to uh, to the school setting where they they compete with each other. And, and, and you know as well as I do, when you have friendly competition, and everybody improves. And so I would invite you to come by. Uh, the um, Dr. Addison would love for you to come by the intermediate school and let him walk you through and show you the different houses that they have set up and how they decide who or how how the house members decide who's going to be the house uh, made. That just going right through, this is probably the most exciting thing we have in the classrooms. We've already started and another time is going and I can talk forever about what we've got going on. But our mobile classroom STEM is a very, very, um, um, very subject that's dear to my heart uh, and dear to, to what I think uh, we need to be focusing on. We have found, thanks to uh, Ms. Stockman, uh, principal at the uh, junior high school, uh, we've got two school buses that are being renovated to mobile STEM mobile STEM centers. One will be a STEAM, which will include an art concept of K through three. The uh, STEM will be really for fourth through eighth grade. Uh, there, there will be power hookup in, in the schools where the, the students will be able to uh, incorporate hands-on and minds-on learning in what they've learned in the classroom. There will be different modules based on uh, whatever the, the topic will be. You know, it's going in the science classroom. It's going to be, be designed to uh, to be cross-curricular uh, involving social studies, math, science, to where all, all subjects would be integrated into a, a service project or a project learning based learning. That's very important. That will be something very visible in the very near future. Very near future. Uh, the next couple of pages, we've got scholarship snapshot. Uh, I mean, let's face it, our job is to prepare our students for post-secondary college or post-secondary workforce. You'll notice and these are some phenomenal numbers and, and I do apologize there was some, we had some principal changes at a couple of schools and of course last year with COVID we didn't have complete numbers. But if you'll notice in, in 2020, the Togoville School, 250 uh, student school, K-12 had $331,000 in scholarships that were awarded to the senior class. That's phenomenal for a senior class that probably was 15 to 18. And if you look to the buildings at school, it's going to be 28,600. Uh, Marbury High School in 2020 was $3.2 3 million. .2 million. By that, there, there was a large number of, of athletic scholarships prevented or presented at that time. Same way for Bradford High School in 2019, they had a little over 4 million, which is phenomenal for a seven day school. Very phenomenal. But you got to remember, we cannot operate a seven day school in a five day building. And it takes money for us to do that and to continue these things where we can compete academically, athletically, extracurricular, fine arts, and all. Uh, you'll look through, we've had this year, um, we've had currently, we have one National Merit Finals and one semifinals. Um, so our curriculum apparently is working. Uh, it's, it's working very well. You know, when you educate every student that we get, you know, you, you, you've got to meet their needs, whether they uh, are the lowest of the low or the highest of the high. I think we do a phenomenal job. Uh, you look at our AP snapshot, I think there were a couple of years ago, uh, maybe three or four years ago, the high schools went through uh, A-plus training. We are beginning to go through some uh, security dates for our ACT training. Uh, we started working on those dates just recently. Our report card, and I won't go through everything on here, just need to point out this is reported data. In other words, by reported, that means it's weighted. Uh, it, takes, it, it takes out the things that we can't necessarily control. And so if you look at, um, you know, we've got our, it looks at our, our systems letter grade. Of course, Tyler County Schools has a letter grade of B. You know, we want to be an A system. We think we're an A system. We were an A system, uh, you know, several years ago, and that's where we want to go back. And I think we're on the trajectory to, to get to that point. Uh, I started when I started in January. I started looking at how we as a system can promote ourselves, and we started tagging and started using 
term advance to Tyler County. And by advance to Tyler County, we're not only advancing the school system, uh, extracurricular, athletics, fine arts, uh, academic, but we're also advancing the Tyler County's economy. Uh, We've got a good schools, bring, bring more jobs. I read it, this may not be the exact numbers, there's roughly about 4,000 uh, people that come into work in the Tyler County today. But about 8,000 leave the Tyler County to go to work today. And ideally, you want, you want that number to be, or you want more to come into Tyler County than go out. And, and by saying that, I mean we've got to, our educational system has got to advance, we've got to work with the industry, the government leaders, so that we can offer and change what our, our potential citizens need. That's, that's, our, that's our job. I'm looking at our uh, four part data. Uh, one thing that we have addressed is chronic absenteeism. Uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, the, the government added uh, chronic absenteeism as a category in the report card. Chronic absenteeism is not just for unexcused absences, it's for all absences. Anyone who's had an absence or 18 or more absences, whether excused or unexcused. Uh, a child is in the hospital, uh, you know, for two weeks. It's not their problem, they get counted and picked as being chronically absent. So I presented that information to show you that yes, we, we do a, a really good job, the teachers do a really good job with what we have and we can do so much more with an additional revenue stream. Uh, just going right along, we can look at our student enrollment, the trends there. Uh, yes, we are our student population is decreased, population of the county as a whole is decreased too. So you got to look at some things it's not just you know students exiting the county because of this or because of that uh, they're exiting because families are local today they're not they're not necessarily at home just like we are when we were growing up we did stay in the same place uh just moving on through we can show uh, another need that our students have that, that it's costing some local uh that we can use additional revenue for as our social and emotional health for our students the past year has been a trying time for our students charge of time at home by themselves, away from friends, and so we're seeing our DHR referrals up, our nurse referrals are up, our uh, mental health council referrals are up. Those are things that we've got to address. If we cannot, if we cannot address the needs of our students that way, we can't expect them to, to learn. Uh, and that, take, that takes money. Also, I will say too, our nurse, uh, our students need to full time nurse nursing care, whether it's on the bus or at home, has increased every year for the past three or four years. And nurse, nursing care is very expensive. Uh, that is what I have. If there's any questions, I would take them, but I, I do want to say, I, 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 I couldn't stand up here with my teachers behind me and staff over to my left without saying, we have, we have a great county. We have a great county system. Uh, my teachers, not my teachers, our teachers do a phenomenal job every day in what they have. We've had teachers doing uh, double duty this year because they wanted to make sure their virtual students had the same opportunity that their in class students. And I, I want to say, to me, this, this is not, this is about it. It's not about a charter school or a private school or anything like that. It's not about that.
what am I asking for? Yes, the first slide. To be equitably treated uh, financially as uh, we can be with uh, other public school uh, entities in, in the county. We need an additional rate in order to be competitive with, uh, with the counties around us. You know, we've got to look at service salaries, we've got to look at athletic supplements, we've got to look at facilities. So we've got to be able to begin the process of keeping up um, with, it, with our neighboring counties and, and our additional revenue stream that allows us to do that. Can you, can you present a more precise business type plan that will map out exactly what dollar amounts you're asking for and how precise the value of dollar amounts is? Yeah. I, can. I, I, I can, uh, just as quickly as I can get home and get with my thing and we can get it printed out. I certainly would appreciate that and then also, uh, is there any way, how easy or difficult is it to find out what the uh, teacher-student ratio is in all the classrooms in the university? Uh, I can let you know that as soon as I get to the office. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions from the council? Uh, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, so you, you made several, uh, I guess, mentions of things that you guys need to improve on as far as infrastructure and curriculum. What would you say is probably number one that's been listed? That would be hard to say. Um, I think the first three, the most visible things that can be quickly done would be um, you know, upgrade to that, our athletic facilities. Uh, that, that could be something that's very visible. Uh, certainly, um, plans, whether you have it, you start now or a year down the road or whatever, have a vision of what the a new high school would look like, a new elementary school. You know, we're, we're uh, busting at the seams
Uh, we are tuition free. Tiger Prospect Academy does not charge a dollar to attend. So we are a public school, tuition free. Um, our charter was granted in September of uh, 2020, and we are approved for prior, priority enrollment in Atauga County. So we are a public school. I'm going to say that as many times as I can. We are a public school with Atauga County as our priority enrollment zone. Uh, we are open for all students. We do not discriminate. education for students with special needs, for ELL students, as well as all given students. We are a public school. Um, no money, pro bono. All board members are pro bono. We don't receive a salary. We don't receive any benefits. Uh, there, there's there's no, no money switching hands here. Um, you know, if there's, there's, there are rules and regulations, and I want to kind of address this now in, in case it, it, it's brought up later, that as a founding board, that is, that is what is required of us to bring forth a charter application, get approved, and prior to the first day of school, we become a governing board. Prior to becoming a governing board, we all pass background checks. We go through a complete code of ethics uh, class, and you know, so I, I know there's some things going around out there, but let me tell you that everything will be addressed, um, and that's all we'll say about that. Uh, no seats have been awarded. I, I know that everybody thinks every last seat has been given away. Not one single seat has been awarded at Ivy Classical Academy. That will be done in an open enrollment where people, if we have more capacity, but if we have 642 seats and 643 apply, 643 names are entered into a public lottery that is done by a third party administrator. We don't select behind closed doors, it's all done above board. But let me stress that no seats have been awarded. Lottery system, I kind of got that myself, but you know, if there's any questions regarding that, we can address those. School choice. This is, this is where we get to meet the phase. School choice was made possible in 2015 by the Alabama legislature. legislature. Um, what this means for Coffee County is parents can now make a choice between enrolling their students in Ivy Classical or keeping them in their assigned the Coffee County Public School. It's a choice. School choice. The school choice helps students. Overwhelming evidence demonstrates that school choice programs improve academic outcomes for those who participate. And academics are only one measure of this achievement. School choice has a tremendous positive impact on graduation rates, enrollment in college, civic and community engagement, reduction in crime, and improved parent and student satisfaction. We can't speak to all charter schools, many differences, but we can say that the curriculum that we are using in 11 states, over 30 charter schools, has resulted in a 20% average net increase in math and reading proficiencies. These numbers you see here are from the sister school in Atlanta. They recently reported the data from their first two graduating classes, so 2019 and 2020. 100% college acceptance, the number one SAT score for the district, and $8.3 million in scholarships over less than 100 students. Those numbers are outstanding. Those numbers would be something that any community in America would be proud of. Another thing that we've been, we've been hearing is that uh, school choice means stealing money. That is just flat out wrong. That's, you know, that myth is, uh, you know, I'm going to address it, but um, talking county residents now have school choice. This empowers families to choose where they want to spend their educational tax dollars they are entitled to. If, it, if a family enrolls at Ivy, it's by choice, not by force. It is their choice, not ours. Likewise, anyone can choose not to send their child to Ivy Classical, but they do not have the right to make that decision for anybody else. So let's take down the negative comments. It's okay to be against the school, but don't criticize or bully those who support it. After all, choice is what has made America great. That does, that does school choice have a negative financial impact on the existing school districts? And you can't see this, but there's been 20, 28 fiscal, oh, you can't see it. Thank you for telling me. Uh, there's been 28 fiscal uh, studies done on the impact of school choice. Not a single one found that there was a negative financial impact on any existing school district. Positive, positive impact. 
Many studies, D.C., Florida, Milwaukee, uh, there, there's countless studies, they show abundant evidence that school choice encourages existing school districts to improve. School choice brings about competition, and competition drives excellence. I think the superintendent just mentioned that how this how house has worked. He said friendly competition brings excellence. Improves everything. I agree. So, and there have been 33 studies on the educational effects of school choice, 30, 31 of which showed positive effect, one of which showed a neutral effect, and only one showed a negative effect. So why should Prattville embrace school choice? Over 800 students from 500 families of pre enrolled in Iowa High School Academy. This is not a small movement. It's a cry for change. It's a cry for school choice. And Ivy Classical is the only option that provides these families, your constituents, with school choice. And move on to facilities. Has the school selected a final facility? No. Has the city agreed to fund Ivy Classical's facility? No. Has Ivy Classical made a formal request to the city asking for funding? No. The school is narrowing down the final options pending some key developments. And absolutely, High Point is at the top of our list. It's a great location for a school. It's a great location for a campus. It's got great access, great parking, great landscaping, and it has a few big buildings. The only minor setback is that the center sits in Elmore County. And we are working with our district center and speaking to many House members regarding legislation that will permit Ivy Classical to take advantage of these real estate, to take advantage of this real estate opportunity uh, if it passes. Uh, this is not unique to Ivy Classical. Three other charter schools in the last 12 months would have been able to take advantage of better opportunities for their students if they hadn't afforded that same one mile. If this bill passes, it's important to know that housing high and classical high point will have no additional impact in any of the surrounding school districts. We will still offer priority enrollment to all the Capitolia County students, and Elmore students won't have any preferred access or enrollment. Really listen, we would all have less gray hair if high point was in the Capitolia County. So another reason that we are big on high point, and another reason it's the top of the list, is the immense cost savings. We've had many discussions with developers and architects. And the benchmark study that's released every year recently reported that the average school construction cost is over $300 per square foot. Using industry figures and putting that plainly, if, if High Point works out, I think we'll be probably providing a Tallgate County students with an 80 plus million dollar school campus for $22.8 million. Many Facebook comments have been made about Thompson High School, Auburn High School, Trustville High School, that Frank Prattle simply cannot afford to build a school of that magnitude. I would agree at, at $300 a square foot, even at $200 a square foot, I would agree that's, that's out, out of the room. Uh, Superintendent said, Moore said that we have to keep up with the Joneses. This is an opportunity where we can do that. I would say that it's already half built. We just need to finish the job and we can put the ghost of the pipe on to bed.
there will still be a very meaningful cost saving for traditional public school building costs, which are, uh, we, we anticipate we can do it for $180 to $200 per square foot. But so why should Prattville embrace Ivy Classical at high point? The 2040 top plan ranked public schools as the top issue, with business development third on the list. Other comments from vision casting sessions centered on education as well as the vacant retail of Highland. Ivy Classical Academy occupying Highland presents a unique opportunity for the city of Prattville to satisfy a multitude of constituent concerns and does so at 30 cents on the dollar, making it an efficient use of educational tax dollars. I have to bring this up. This is, uh, I was trying to find a budget matrix that compares Ivy Classical with the Talbot County, and as what would happen, somebody directed me to this. It was on safepravel.com. Every ounce of information on this slide is incorrect. Every last ounce. But this is what's being pushed out as fact as a misinformation campaign against Ivy Classical Academy. I could, I could debate these individually, but I want you to focus on one number, $22.8 million. That's the anticipated construction cost for high We have never asked the city for $22.8 million. Let me repeat that. We have never asked the city for $22.8 million. In our one meeting with the city council, we had preliminary discussions about this and what a bond payment might like look like. But nothing was formally requested and certainly nothing was formally agreed to. It was an informational session, not a claim that's not meeting. So our, to our friends on safepravel.com, the business perception that Ivy Classical Academy has never requested $22.8 million from the city of Prattville, nor will we. But what are we doing here? We are here seeking equal footing. We are seeking fairness, and we are seeking a level playing field. And to get a better understanding of what that means, we need to look back. And let me preface that some of my numbers will be different than some of the superintendent's numbers. My, my information stops at 2020. He has, he has the magic key. Federal funding. In the last seven years, our public school has received well over half a billion dollars in revenue, 583 million dollars to be exact. Of that, 132 million dollars has been generated through local taxes, local sales tax, and Lauren tax. I looked at the audits and was able to confirm that our county schools have experienced a steady and consistent uptake in revenue. This is the last fiscal year audit that was on the website in 2020. So this, this is the most recent audit that shows that Atalka County received $90 million last year. That's $11 million more than it received in 2014. What makes this jump in funding even more dramatic is that our county school in Bowman has dropped 1,000 students since 2010. This means that our schools are receiving much more money per pupil today than seven years ago. And that is a great thing. Looking back at the side, we'll also see that the county schools received $19 million the funding, uh, $19 million from local taxes in 2020, a strong majority of which was generated within the city limits. That's part of the countywide one cent education tax as well as that one tax in the city. However, this is a big one. Ivy Classical will not receive a single dollar from these local taxes, which is really why the real reason we stand before you today. We are the least funded school in the Talking County. We are uh, due to, to the disparity in how local funds are dispersed. We receive much less per pupil than the remainder of all other county schools. As you can see here, Ivy will only receive $7,700 per student, while of all other public schools receive $9,900. Ivy Classical Academy will receive $2,000 less per pupil to educate our same, same children. We're not asking the city for an unfair advantage. We're not asking the city to give us a boost out of the gates or to buy us a new facility at high point. We are simply asking for the city to treat Ivy Classical in an equal manner, providing constituents who choose Ivy with a fair share of local funds on a per pupil basis. Atalka County has no legal obligation to share local tax. But the city of Prattville, the largest contributor to local school tax, has a chance to make things fair for all students. Remember, Ivy Classical is a public school serving all students of Otago County. Why should our students, our families, your constituents be kept at a disadvantage regarding access to their local education funds? 
using 2020 numbers, each student in the Tulsa County received $2,000 of local funding, $2,000. If I in class for Academy received an equitable per pupil split of local taxes, our local funding would be about 1.33 million. It would be enough to satisfy the bond to cover the purchase and renovation of the pipeline. It would be enough to cover the purchase or construction of any new facility within the city limits. So we sincerely ask that the city consider putting Ivy Classic Academy on fair and equal per pupil basis so that all public school students in our county are funded fairly. Why should travel debate embrace Latin classrooms? We are the solution. If overcrowding is an issue, we can help alleviate the pressure across all grades and from all schools. If a new facility is needed, Ivy Classical is that new facility, and we will be able to provide the students for Tulsa County at significant savings compared to traditional school construction costs. Constituents have clearly shown that school choice is one, Ivy is the only approved school choice. We have a different curriculum. Crabble will have the first public school in Alabama to offer a tuition-free classical education. Increased enrollment. Not all students in the Tulsa County are in the public school system. Ivy's curriculum will attract homeschool and private school students to return to the public education system. Military. We have been in communication with Maxwell Air Force Base and key personnel, and the reception has been extremely popular. Military families are excited about this opportunity, and we believe Ivy will be one of the driving forces for, for, for a resurgence in military families bringing their children to travel, reversing a negative trend which is not currently being addressed. In closing, it is the responsibility of elected officials to ensure that all constituents are heard and treated fairly. So I urge each of you on the City Council to look at the facts hear the voices of the parents and children who want school choice, who need school choice, and take back, take the steps necessary to ensure that their voices are given fair and equal representation and equal access to our local education taxes. Now that's the end of the written portion, but I want to let those words resonate with you for a minute because the superintendent, when he was asked, what are you asking for? And he said, I want equitable treatment. I don't want any one school to have a disproportionate amount of funds. That's what we want. We're all on the same page. We are all on the same page. Any questions? Does the council have any questions? Yes, sir. You said that you did not ask or mention 2228 to the city council? Ask and mention are two different words. I did not ask. Does any other council have any questions? And also, our introduction to you a couple years ago uh, at a council meeting, and I guess they would hope that you were prior to that council meeting. It was kind of a spectacle to be able to bring them back to the council chamber. People that the developer did a liar, broke the dice, So there's a difference between 
are you aware of any other uh, charter schools in our state that were funded without having to know county or, or city or maybe corporate sponsorship uh, as far as facilities go? And also, as far as facilities go, are there any other that you're considering less than 28.8 million or they're all around that same amount? So the first part of the question, are there any charter schools in the state of Alabama that, so that there are plenty that are doing well and some that are and the ones that are doing well have financial backing for what I would consider non-governmental aid entities. Uh, for example, Breakthrough Academy is partnering with Marion, uh, uh, the Marion uh, Military uh, you know, so it, it's uh, uh, what's uh, advanced. It was Magic City Acceptance Academy. Their partner was the Magic City Foundation. Uh, Dr. Tommy Weiss, the former superintendent of the state, now runs I3 Academy in Birmingham. And so, you know, the, the funding mechanism for charter schools, for startup charter schools, is broken. Academically, we, we can sustain ourselves but without facilities. And, and that's really the, the, the way the law was written. Talker County, we're supposed to work with them for vacant, unused school facilities. There are none. There, 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 there are no vacant facilities. So without supplemental support through local, I mean, if, if it was an equitable share of local funding, we'd have no issues. But they, they're not legally obligated to give us dollar one. And so the, the second question, if you can repeat it. OK, so another question, I'm going to go over facility in Birmingham to my wife and Dr. Davis and you know about funding for that facility which is doing I think in Woodlawn where it is doing very well they didn't draw any money from the city of Woodlawn or Jefferson County. The other question was 22.8 for the facility at High Point. Are there other facilities or not the built facilities throughout the city or county that are coming less and if they are where does that ballpark figure? And what's the amount of time on the payment on this bond? Well, we're not we're not requesting a bond, we're requesting local funding. So I mean that, that would be right. uh, we would be able to take on the bond as an entity ourselves. Uh, so that would not the, the city would not have to validate the bond, nor would you the public outlines. Uh, so it's it's two different avenues. If the city wants to discuss a bond issue, we can discuss that all day long. I mean we're we're very, very flexible. We just want to roof over our heads. There is no roof more cost effective than high point. Hundred dollars square foot for a big campus that will it, it's the most beautiful charter school campus in America. It will be talked about for hundreds of years to come. That's how impactful that facility is. And so we're gonna we're gonna keep pushing, we're gonna keep dreaming big, but if it cannot happen, we can do tailor construction somewhere else. Uh, you know, we can, we can you know, do modular tech campuses while we continue to get fight for high point. We're open to, to all things. Um, you know, very much. Mm -hmm. um, so you just said that you're not requesting a bond, you're requesting local funding so that you guys can handle the bond on your own. Essentially, it's still with the city of Franklin County paying off that bond. Correct. Correct. I mean, it's in, in, in an indirect fashion. So right now, the, the, the Talking County Schools are having a one cent countywide sales tax that is one cent in the city and one cent out of the city specifically for them. We know that generates about six point eight million dollars a year. The average one tax within the city, Daniel, I, I don't know the answer, but let's call it five million, four million. So let, let's just say that there's ten million in local tax going to a talk account of students. What we're asking is the city to do today is of the additional funds that you're willing to disperse to education, bring up to level playing field. We are a public school. We're teaching the same kids from our neighbors, our friends, our families. We're the same boat of people. So we're asking you to say, before we give a talk at any, any additional money, we're not taking anything away from them. It's revenue neutral. But before you give them additional money, bring us up to the same level. That's what we're asking for. We're looking for equitable distribution of city-generated local education tax dollars. Hope that makes sense. Those of you know the council, I have any questions. It's not going to self-fulfill. It won't. 
500 students from the Tulsa County apply, they all get in. If there's 501, all of their names go in a hat, and their 500 are going out. In the, the only event in which a Delmore student or a Chilton student or any other student, yeah, let's just call them non Atalga students, the only event in which they can enroll at Ivy Classical is if we do not fill capacity from the Tulsa County students first. And we cannot open it up to specific counties afterwards. If we do not fulfill capacity from Tulsa County, it's open to the entire state. and 
in the county and vice versa. So there will be shared resources. We, we've had conversations with people that when we have an address at high point, they're talking about a cultural grant where we can build a full class greenhouse. We're not going to keep that to ourselves. We're going to share that with everybody in the county and everybody in the group of our region. Same thing. I mean, uh, uh, Superintendent Tidmore mentioned STEM. These are things we're interested in as well. You know, class work curriculum is thousands of years old. But STEM is very much needed. And so if there's a way for us to partner, we can share those resources. The only request we have is we don't have a roof because the local funding component is broken. And you have a very unique opportunity to tell your constituents that you decide we're going to fund you on an equitable basis, on a per pupil basis, and we're going to get this done. We're not asking for any preferential treatment. Well, how many teachers do you need to spend on the percent of plus students? So our students need to do takeaway for the Coffee County. If we have full enrollment, it's six four kids, maybe six hundred and fifty students, but at the end of the day, it's not a one for one. But I'm saying it's part of the team. Well, you know, uh, K through three, it's slated at sixteen, I think the exact number is eight, eighteen students per teacher unit, you know, it's, so that there's different mechanisms. We're for K through six, how many teacher units I think at pre enrollment we're at forty. But we've got a much lower student to teacher ratio. So we have more we have more teachers to teach the same students that, that you know, Dr. Tidmore right in there asked you what your student to teacher ratio is. I think online it says 18 to 1. I think that, that, that number is easily misconstrued. I'll say the same thing about us on paper, we're 12 to 1, but they count. What I would say classroom teachers plus aides and things of that nature. So that, that's not the true figure for us, it's not the true figure for them. But in terms of teacher units, I can assure you this. For every displaced teacher in the talking account, there will be more in it because we're going to have a lower, it's part of classical education, it's hands-on, it's very rigorous, there's, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's one of the things that we're very adamant about. And so, all of our money that we have from the state foundational level, so, you know, we've, we've had discussions with David Lewis as well, the final seating, because he's sitting half empty Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. We're not going to deploy assets for gymnasiums and things like that if we can have a valuable community partnership that works both ways. Academics are what need help. Academics and curriculum are what need help, and we're bringing that. And it's not, and we're going to have resources, professional development, teacher development, how to be a better teacher. That's part of our classical curriculum. It's to be open to any public school teacher in the river region, the Target County, and, and as well. So that's, that's where we're up to.
less for twice the square footage. This is a once in a generation opportunity. And again, I know there's a lot of bad blood with High Point and everything that's gone on, but this is a chance to put it to bed for good. Because if we are given those local funding, or it's equitable local funding, we are here to stay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you drive up to High Point, you've got Jason Penny on one end and Belk on the other. And you've got vacant space in the middle. It's actually six buildings. There's, there's space that is uh, affixed to Jason Penny that is not Jason Penny. Uh, most of them are closed. And then you've got a two story vacant building and three other single story buildings that you face off towards the Belk. So all told, we were talking about acquiring 230,000 square feet and converting it into a full class. So if we're not talking about anything on the public's level, we'll talk about it. Any other questions? Thanks, Brad.
Yes, sir. Thank you. You know, it's uh, education is very, very important, and the military is very, very important, and uh, they are intertwined through our community, and part of that is the education uh, portion as well. It's through our churches, through our athletics, so, so many different things. And, you know, we have so many great things going on in this community now. And a lot of it, because a lot of the people that are here, here, they are educators. And I'm going to bring um, uh, Mr. Jackson. You know, to me, I think it's a tragedy. Travesty when our educator has to take money out of their pockets. And I think I saw a report that like 95% of the across the nation have to spend somewhere between five and six hundred dollars a year out of their own pockets for the classrooms. I think that is something that should be looked into, something we ought to be able to, to see if there's any way we can handle all this. But you know, as elected officials for the city of Brown, uh, we have been given the task to uh, watch over our funds and everything else. And over the years, there has been a lot of distrust, a lot of distrust between the city, the county, the county commissioners, and the board of aid. And this is not the first time that there have been something similar to this. Uh, after all this started coming around, I started doing a little bit of research, have several documents right here before me. We're going to be working together to try to get these documents out so the citizens can really see that. Because it really spells and, and lays out history. And we all know about the history repeating itself. That's almost what's going on here today. Is that just history has come back around. Uh, technology is a lot more uh, easily available for all of us. Technology is, is taken so that more and more people can realize what's going on. But I think when these documents are, are really brought out there, I, I think we will see that we need to come together as a community. It needs to be the board of ed. It needs to be the county commission. It needs to be the, the city. But now one thing, again, we are elected officials for the corporate limits. And I have preached for many years about the Parkers of Brown. And I come from small business. I was over here on the, the basically the west side of Brown and the east side was uh, so so important to the people who still want to look down a lot. Now because of the investments, thank goodness, my son and daughter and grandkids, they don't have to go to other locations. They can buy and enjoy so many things going on here. Because of some of the investments. But one of these reports that I found, uh, it was a report from the City Education Evaluation Committee. And, uh, and this is one of the ones we'll be getting out there. But in the closing comments of it, I've written down here failure of the elected bodies, the City Council, the County Commission, and the Board of Ed to address education needs in our community will ultimately diminish the quality of life. And closing the quote here on that as well says, I think the cost of education is, is expensive to try to increase. That's from JFK. You know, we do have a, an opportunity here today to counsel the community size to come together. And it ought to be a lot more positive than what it is. And social media has been one of the driving forces for it to be so negative, and it should not be. It ought to be so positive, because right now, we have ways to fix some things that really ought to be improved on. Education system up here to do the best job that they can, and I think they're excellent for where they are. Do they need funding? Yes. The one penny that has been discussed, and one reason why we have these work sessions, personally, I think it ought to be about the If the community decides they're going to move forward. And uh, last week, uh, our last council meeting, we had infrastructure. I think we all know how important that is. How many people showed up for that? I think I see about four. Yeah, it might have been three or four, okay, that showed up for that. I am glad to see everybody here today, but I hope that when we come back to the next council meeting, about the um, parks and recs, because it is also very, very important. Uh, a little bit of history in time. After I first became mayor here, we didn't have two quarters to go together. I had a group of unofficial financial advisors come to me and tell me that if we got cut and we don't have to have parks and recs, if you cut them out from London, I said, you know how any like that really is? Is that because if I would do that, I would take the money and give that plus more to our police officers who have more issues. Sports is so much more. You know, Friday night lights down here. It's as much a social event as it is the football game itself. So there's so many things that brings the community together. But I think the one penny, if it is decided on by the community, the elected body up here, uh, infrastructure.
infrastructure, education, parks, rec, and public facilities. When I say that, I mean something like the library and performing creative parts. So we do have an opportunity here. Y'all have been a lot more confident than what it is today because we are, this community is a lot better than what I've seen in social media. So Mr. President and City Council and the citizens out here, I hope we've all come together on this. I think another committee needs to be pulled together because we need to be pulling together instead of ripping each other apart. Thank you.
Is there any discussion on these minutes? Hearing none, all in favor for adopting the minutes of raise your right hand. All opposed by the light sign, the minutes are adopted. At this time, we'll welcome any comments from persons present regarding tonight's agenda. I repeat, we welcome any comments from person present regarding tonight's agenda. Hearing none. All Mr. Mayor.
pages of capital projects fund income statement. The city has spent approximately $2.35 million on projects during the first half of the fiscal year. Project expenses during this quarter relate primarily to the remounting of the Kansas City Resources Center project, the Macquarie Park 2.0 project, Station 4 construction, and the Washington Street drainage project. Next page is the group health fund income statement. Friday in July 2021, which is July 16, 2021. 
2021 and ending at 12 midnight the following Sunday, July 18, 2021. This ordinance shall be subject to all terms, conditions, definitions, time periods, and rules as provided by section 4023-210 through 4023-213, Code of Alabama, 1975, as amended, except that the time period shall only be as specified in section one above and not for all years thereafter. The city clerk is hereby authorized and directed to certify a copy of this ordinance under the seal of the city of Prattville, Alabama, and to forward said certified copy to the Alabama Department of Revenue to be reported and posted on the department website. This ordinance shall become effective upon its passage and publication as required by law. So moved, Mr. President. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second. I pull the order. The council rules must be suspended in order for this item to be considered tonight. Is there a motion to suspend the rules? We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second. Madam Clerk, will you conduct a roll call vote? Councilor Strickland? Aye. Councilor Jackson? Aye. Councilor Chambers? Aye. Councilor Starnes? Yay. Yeah. Councilor Gorto? Yay. Yeah. Councilor Stritchick? Aye. Councilor Booth? Yay. The rules are suspended. Is there any discussion on the ordinance? Hearing none, all in favor for this ordinance, raise your right hand. All those by life sign, the ordinance is adopted. Ordinance number three, to adopt regulations for small cell technology facilities in the city of Crapple, Alabama. Council Chamber, will you introduce this ordinance? Yes, sir. Uh, whereas the city of Crapple, Alabama uh, seeks to facilitate the availability of reliable personal wireless services and support citizens and the public by permitting the placement of small cell technology facilities and associated structures along the right of way on and on private properties in the city. Whereas, pursuant to Alabama Code 11-45-1, municipal corporations may adopt resolutions and ordinances to provide for the safety, preserve the health, promote prosperity, improve the welfare, order, comfort, and convenience of the inhabitants of the municipality. And whereas the installation, expansion, and maintenance of small cell technology facilities and associated structures on or along the right of way and on private properties might have significant impact on one of the aesthetic values and character of the city, two, safe use and passage on or along the right of way by the public, and three, properties and property values in the city and areas where such structures are placed. And whereas the Federal Telecommunication Telecommunications Act of 1996 regulations uh, promulgated with respect to the act of the Federation of Communications Commission authorized local governments to enact reasonable regulations for the permission, placement, expansion, height, and maintenance of small cell technology facilities and associated structures. And whereas, as provided in this ordinance and is permitted by federal and state law, the city seeks to encourage, where feasible, the uh, collection, uh, collocation of small cell technology facilities on existing poles and other structures as opposed to installation of new structures. And whereas the above noted collocation and other provisions of this ordinance are intended to be consistent with the act and is associated regulations. And whereas the adoption of the regulations, procedures, and requirements in this ordinance will permit applicants and providers to enhance the provision of personal wireless service and protect the public welfare, health, safety, and interest of the city citizens. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Prattville, Alabama, that the City of Prattville Code of Ordinances, Chapter 58, Telecommunications, is hereby amended as follows. Can you read all that? Just, no, just make it wrong. So, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we have a motion. We have a second. We have a second. By the way, by point of order, the council rules must be suspended in order for this item to be considered tonight. Is there a motion to suspend the rules? We have a motion. We have a second. We have a second. Madam Clerk, we conduct a roll call vote. Councilor Jackson? Aye. Councilor Chambers? Aye. Councilor Starnes? 
Yay. All opposed by the light sign. The ordinance is adopted. Ordinance number four to extend the temporary moratorium on permits and approvals for multifamily apartment developments. Councilor Porto, you introduce this ordinance. Yes, sir. Whereas the City Council of the City of Proper adopted Ordinance Book 2020, page 28, on December 15, 2020, establishing a temporary moratorium on the issuance of building permits for multifamily or apartment developments. And whereas the temporary moratorium is set to expire April 30th, 2021, and whereas the Proper Planning Commission adopted Project Proper 2040, the updated comprehensive plan at their April 15th, 2021 meeting, and whereas the Proper Planning Commission is in the process of rewriting the zoning ordinance, and whereas the temporary moratorium needs to be extended until the zoning requirements are updated and adopted by the council. Now, therefore, we ordained by the City Council of the City of Proper that in order to protect the public health, safety, and welfare, it is in the best interest of the city to extend the temporary moratorium on the issuance of building permits or other approval for any multifamily or apartment development consisting of three or more dwelling units. Be it further ordained that the extended moratorium shall continue through December 31st, 2021, unless terminated or extended by action of the City, of, of the city Council. Provided that multifamily developments that have received an approved building permit prior to the effective date of Ordinance Number 2020-28 may proceed as allowed on the terms of the permit and applicable rules and regulations. Also, this moratorium does not apply to changes in zoning or to permits for remodel or repair that does not add to the current number of bedrooms or units or expand the current size of the development. So do this We have a motion. We have a second. I point the order the council rules must be suspended and for the side to be considered or not. Is there a motion to suspend the rules? Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second. Madam Clerk, will you conduct the roll call vote?
We have a motion. We have a second. We have a second. Is there any discussion on this resolution? Hearing none, all in favor for this resolution, raise your right hand. All opposed by like sign. The resolution is adopted. Resolution number seven. To release funds for the purchase of one 2021 Ram 2500 crew cab 4x4 truck through state bid T191 from Spiders Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram for the wastewater division at a net cost not to exceed $29,899. Councilor Strickland, we introduce this resolution. Yes, sir. Whereas there's a need for one. that goes to the public school child being educated as a parent of a homeschooler, I get 
no help. And I'm okay with that. It's my choice. And I can see the results of my choice. Ultimately, I just want to say, for everyone in the audience and the council, my hope is that the conversations will continue, that facts will rule out failures and fear, and then in the end, we'll come to resolutions that will be beneficial for all kids involved. Sir, any counselor, do you have any questions? Hey, thank you and welcome to Brown. Yes, sir. Hi, John Lee Finning, Individual of Engineer Trips. I listened with interest at the presentations by the BOE and I. I only have a few comments, and these are only my opinion regarding them. I firmly believe that children should have the best education possible. When my former husband and I moved here 31 years ago without children, I could not believe how little we paid in taxes. I have always said that I would be more than willing to pay more taxes to help with education as I feel our school system is woefully underfunded. The idea of a charter school is not wrong. How is it, how it is financed is. As everyone is aware, the city is considering a $22.8 million bond for the purpose and renovations of High Point Town Center, build, Town Center buildings for the charter school. The city has already paid close to 20 million for this portion of the long-term debt of the bonds approved in 2005. Granted, this long-term debt is supposedly to be paid off this summer, yet we are now going to replace it with another debt. Mr. Oakley just stated in his report the total debt remaining as a is $52,446,334.65. We don't know if other debts are, come, are coming. At that same finance committee meeting mentioned earlier, the mayor stated that there were two economic development projects that potentially would need assistance, and these entities have asked this information to be kept private, so therefore executive sessions will be needed. This is just an example of possible future deaths. I do understand that children's education is so important, but we are talking about a tremendous amount of money for the education of so few. If I understand correctly, the 22.8 million is just to purchase the buildings and make renovations, not for yearly running of the school, which is, I believe, and I can't remember the amount, I have five million, I think it was more than that, and that additional monies would also be allotted from the city for this. Whatever the cost, Ivy and the city need to be completely transparent. For example, when looking through Ivy's application, I and others could not open any of the attachments, some of which deal directly with finances. Before any action is taken, all meetings on this matter should now be public. No more executive sessions should be held behind closed doors. Details should be readily and easily available, and full citizen involvement must be allowed. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions from the counselors? Thank you. And sir, thank you for the patience. Thank you, sir. Good evening. My name is Hale Michael Sagan, and I live in 621 West Forest District 1. I'm also a, mil a retired military officer, field grade officer, 25 years and 11 months, 11 days. I went to school at Dunstan High School. So education is of the utmost, talking to someone who's also pursuing a doctorate degree. You know, the gentleman that came up here and talked about Ivory School, he said a lot of words, but he showed no action. One, he didn't bring a mission statement or a vision. In order to succeed in anything, you have to have a mission statement and a vision. He didn't bring it before you, or before the, uh, people, the very people that he asked the money for. You know, you talk about fair equity. How are we going to assume that it's going to be fair equity in those schools when they choose? You talk about school choice. How is that going to be school choice when you've got certain people that can't even afford to go to the public schools that they go, they go to for transportation. Last year, the Board of Education, Spencer and Kitty, made a decision to open the school and said that the students had a choice. They either going to do uh, in school or they going to do uh, a, 
a hybrid. I mean, he didn't even say a hybrid. He said either mixed school or online. If you know your constituents and the people you serve, tell me how many internet is out there in Joplin community. How many internet is in Lot? How many internet is in uh, Shiloh? Reason why I ask that question? Because I grew up in, in Joplin, but I live here now due to my military uh, conversation and my military uh, disability. How is that even? How is that a choice? When they open the school up, how is it going to be a choice when they can't afford the transportation to go to the school? We have to be very, very aware of what we, what, we, what we agree to, especially when you spend the taxpayer money. And I know me and my wife spend quite a few in taxpayer money. We owe back every year. Did they, did they, did they announce that most of the school are uh, that 15% of the school, charter school, start off and they close within the five years? Did you know that? 15% of charter schools start, they, they don't have the, the, the fund and they close within five years. So how are they going to continue? Or if you go to Google, Google, the best friend, you can check it. I can tell by my way. So, with that being said, we have to watch what's being said. He said he didn't come up here and ask for $28.8 million, but yet he asked for a bond. Well, that sounds like asking for some mention. Sir, I'm going to have to cut you off. You see me in three minutes. Thank you, but I, I do ask that you think how before you waste the taxpayers' money into a school that may not be. Is there anyone else that would like to speak this way? And please state your name and address in time for three minutes. There are a lot of issues that are presented that 
they want to make it appear like they can fix it, but if constant, uh, like chronic absenteeism, that's an issue because kids don't have the right to school. And on one day, I had two students miss an entire day of school because they missed the bus and there wasn't a parent there to get them. Is that parent actually going to be able to drive them 15, 20 miles to the school? No. They're not. So, on okay, paper, this looks pretty and nice and they used a lot of food words and it's, it's fun. But this isn't the cure all. And I, just as an educator, I would also like to say that I understand that there has been bad blood between the city and the commission Man, and the. Counselors, is there any questions? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. I understand that there's been blood, bad blood between the council, commission, and the board of education. However, as a teacher, I have no say in that. Teachers and students, there shouldn't be bad, bad blood between those groups and the teachers and students. And we're the ones really on the ground every day in the trenches fighting for our kids. I have no control over what the board does, so please don't punish my students and the teachers who work so hard because of that kind of bad blood. Like, come, come directly to us. We're totally open to that. But please just don't punish my students because they deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. To save any time for anyone else that would like to speak, if you would just please come and sign in. And that'll give us an opportunity to move a little bit quicker. My name is Melissa Bell. I'm at Four Lakes in the Um I am the body class person, so it's inappropriate for me to speak to my mom. I wanted to address some of the things that were brought up because they're, they're legitimate questions. If you've been reading the false information that's being promulgated on Facebook. And so one lady had a question. She said it's 22.8 million to get a roof over the heads. But then it's five million dollars in operating costs. Are we going to come to the city for those? And no, that's that's not correct. When we look at the Alabama charter school legislation. You can see that we get uh, foundation grant funding from the state, and we get any federal funds that we're entitled to. So Mr. Neve had put those specific numbers up there. So we'll get uh, foundation grants and federal federal funding per student. But we've been able to, with just that seventy-seven hundred dollars per student, make our school budget work. As opposed to the almost, is it 97 million that the county gets per student? Right, it's because we don't have a local funding part. So the $5 million per year operating costs, that comes from the foundation grant, just like the Altaga County gets foundation grant funds. All we're asking for the city is for help getting us a facility. As for 15% of charter school spending in the first year, the gentleman, uh, I don't know if that's the correct number, I have no reason to dispute it. But when charter schools fail, they usually fail for one of two reasons, like funding, which we're asking you to help us address, right, so that we can get those foundation grants that we do have in the classroom where the magic happens between the teacher and the student, right, because that's the most important place. What I think we'll do differently is we'll have a lot less um, at the top in, in public education. I don't know about a talk about this specifically, but in most public education in America today, more than 50% of personnel costs are not teachers. And I will be like that. We'll have very mean costs at the top, putting all of uh, the funding that we get from foundation grants into the classroom where the teachers and students are. Um, another thing that I wanted to address is curriculum. I can talk all day about the classical curriculum, and probably only have a few seconds. Again, my name is Melissa Bell. If anybody wants to learn what classical education is, I'm more than happy to tell you. One of the things that, as I was watching um, the vitriol, like um, factually incorrect um, discussion on Facebook, I was grieved for our children. One of the things we want to do to Ivy, because they were saying we have no mission, we have no vision. Go to ivyclassical.com and you can see our mission and vision. And part of that is to graduate students who can articulate precisely and winsomely. We want to be able to have a civil debate and to model for our students a civil debate based on facts and not innuendo. If 
you're interested in learning about our curriculum and you're really interested in knowing why that and curriculum I'll works, I'll stop. I'll help you. Thank you. Is there any questions from the council? Thank you, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Five. 
all this is so fantastic to talk about education. Um, if anybody knows me for more than 10 minutes, and I'm looking um, at many of you and have participated in lots of different arenas with you guys, I am passionate about education. I am passionate um, as, a, as, a, as a member. We moved to Crowell um, because of the education system. And I'm not going to lie to you, I've been here for 17 years, we've got some stuff we got to work on. We do. Okay. Um, I'll also say as a mom, my two children are currently seniors this year in Atomic County Schools, and they're doing great. And it is because they have had such fantastic people um, over the past 13 years, and I'm going to say 15 years because they've been starting in Camellia. So I'm going to ask for two things. One is you are correct to say, what are the things you guys need? And it's easier to say that when there's one school as opposed to 14. But that's a fair question to say, what are the things you need and what are the things that you need prioritized? Um, and the second thing I would say is just consider what happens when the next group comes and says, we want a charter school. And the next group comes and says, we want a different kind of school. I think that's a fair question to say. Because look, I'll be honest, I mean, you're 25. What if I said, hey guys, I'm going to put together a team a school that we can do will will we have the same um, the same benefits of whatever whatever happens with this and I'm so not opposed to what they're doing I've read their curriculum there's some really good stuff in there I love the competition every other school and public or private school um, are competition for me um, in my in my job and that makes me better that makes me work harder and that makes me be a little more innovative but I would just want to say what kind of precedent does that set questions like I said first give us an opportunity to put on paper what those things are that we need to prioritize because that's a fair question and I will say just with the whole mobile classroom bus project because that's tangible and we know what that is the outpouring of support has been phenomenal with that and so it's a fair question and then secondly what kind of precedent does it set if the next group wants to do something different thank you thank you Thank you, Matthew. Is there anyone else that wants to address the council? Thank you. We'll now move to our closing comments. Mayor. Thank you, Mr.
Y'all do the same. We'll meet you there. We're willing to work with you. But I'm challenging them publicly, and I'm asking everybody who had called me, who emailed me, who Facebooked me, and who showed up tonight, will you please put as much energy into contacting the county divisions and say, hey, the city's had a public meeting. They invited us down. They gave us a chance. They stayed there until the last one of us who wanted to speak said our piece. I'm calling you to say my piece, too. So I challenge you to go to your county officials just like you came to us, and I challenge you to get them involved, to meet us at the table. We want to help the kids. We want to help the teachers. We want to help any type of education that we can that's going to influence economic development as well as the minds of our young people. But please have our partners join us. The teachers and parents, you're already there. You've already joined us. We know where you are. Um, so bring in the rest of our elected officials, and we promise to take this very seriously. Thank you for your time. And I like to say, four or five years ago, there's a couple of few of us counselors jumping up on the table, asking and trying to get education on board and trying to do something for education. And we got some things done working with the, the board. And I, I think it's time, if I heard one thing, I heard it several times, is it's time for to have a tri-governmental meeting against the So if we can set that up and have the county come back together and the Board of Education, and let's talk about things that we can make things better for this community. We have to strive and we have to continue to better fund our school system and make things better for this community. The next city council meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, May 4th, 2021 at 6 p.m. Is there a motion for a We have a motion. Is there a second? We have a second. All in favor say yay. We are adjourned.